Hello everybody and welcome to Provis Gaming and a brand new series for this channel, Hearts of Iron 4, a World War II simulator that uh, people have been requesting pretty much ever since it released, I would say a couple years ago? I don't know, now we're up to the Death and Dishonor expansion and I'm a little bit behind the times here, but the reason I haven't played it in the past is because I criticized this game for not having enough replayability to it. Uh, not enough unique nations with their own national focus, and the strategies for winning are pretty much the same no matter who you play as, it's just a question of starting resources and so on. And those criticisms, I think, are still somewhat valid for Hearts of Iron 4. What I could not have predicted is that the modding scene for this game is actually surprisingly healthy with a lot of enthusiast uh, players, enthusiastic players I mean to say, Try to fill that void with unique nations and so on. Even some awesome overhaul mods like the Kaiserreich mod pack which is uh, basically an alternate history version of the game where the Germans win World War I, which I think looks incredibly exciting. But we're not going to get into that today. Uh, I think that if we are going to be playing that kind of stuff in the future, we should start with a vanilla campaign, just to see if this is something you guys are interested in. It is a little bit shorter than games like EU4, probably only going to take us a few weeks. So let's go ahead and start up a new game. We will be starting off in 1936 before World War II. A good chance to gather up our resources and try to prepare ourselves. And we will be playing as one of the new nations that was introduced in the Death or Dishonor expansion, which tried to focus a lot on the Balkan region, mainly with Yugoslavia, the Kingdom of Romania, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. We're going to start with the Kingdom of Romania today because uh, it's a pretty unique nation, and that actually is historically accurate. Romania is one of the only nations, in fact, I think it is the only nation in World War II, I could be wrong on that, that switched sides during the war. And that actually does play into the mechanics of Romania in this game, and I'm looking forward to using that to our advantage. But to start us off, we are not aligned We are an authoritarian regime led by... I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that in Romanian. I'll just call him George. But, um, yeah, he's the, re the leader right now of the party, but we will be reforming the constitution to make King Carol II into the primary leader of our non-aligned party. King Carol, a very interesting figure in history, uh, not very well liked for obvious reasons in Romania. He was known for a hedonistic and lavish lifestyle, spending tons of state money on his mistress and big parties. And um, I believe he embezzled the nation, uh, several different uh, industrial like contracts and stuff like that several times. He kind of swindled the nation of Romania and was not very well liked. And Romania had a history of going fascist, then having a coup by King Michael, and then joining the Allies later. So, going to be pretty interesting to start us off. King Carol is going to cost us a lot of political power, but I'll show you guys that later. We all do start off with a neutral foreign policy as well. And there are a couple of different paths we could take as Romania, and I'll show you all of that once we get into the game. So, let's go ahead and get started off as the Kingdom of Romania on regular difficulty with historical AI Skadoosh. Now, you can see from the map immediately that we're going to have some interesting... Uh, problems to start us off. We are bordered with the Soviet Union, which historically was a problem for Romania. We're also going to be sandwiched in between the German Reich once that does uh, finally kick off in the Anschluss and Sudetenland and stuff like that and take over Czechoslovakia and Poland. So, gonna be kind of interesting for us being stuck between two major powers. Our goal, I think, is to establish ourselves as a major power. Uh, before that happens, but I don't know. There are a couple things we can look at. So let's go ahead and start with the easy stuff. We will be choosing our research. I always start off with electronic mechanical engineering for the research time reduction, and also go for some construction to speed up our uh, factory building, and also basic machine tools to get a production efficiency increase. Now let's take a look at the national focus because this is where the new stuff comes in with the Death or Dishonored Dishonor expansion, which is pretty cool. So to start us off, you can see that there are two choices as far as how we are going to develop our nation. Because we are sandwiched between the German Reich and the Soviets, we could try so uh, sucking up to one of them, preserve Greater Romania, and then make a deal with the devil and start working toward becoming a member of Comintern, or a member of the Axis, or also a member of the Allies. And what this basically means is we're probably going to stay a minor nation for the entire game, but we got to choose our side and just kind of have fun with that as uh, just sort of an ally of one of the major powers, which is uh, one way to play the game. The alternative is to go for Balkan dominance, which would allow us to basically try finding ways to either conquer or puppet some of our surrounding nations like Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Greece, and even a part of Turkey or the Czechoslovakia. And once we've asserted ourselves as kind of a larger, more imperialistic nation, 
we can either stay non-aligned, right, and uh, basically try to curtail the, the hedonistic lifestyle of the king and make him into a proper leader, or we can have a flexible foreign policy which would allow us to switch sides during the war. For example, we could start off as going communist, try to appease the Soviets, fight down the Germans, and once the Germans have been beaten, switch over to the Allies, possibly, if it works, and then turn on the Soviet Union and try to take their land too. Pretty interesting options for us, and this is historically kind of what the, uh, Romania did, and I think it actually would be more fun to kind of go for this role in the game. Specifically, I think what we may end up doing is trying to go with the Axis. We'll go for a historical focus where Romania does have a fascist government for a time, and then we'll probably try to switch over to the Allies once we've been able to beat down the Soviet Union. That's going to be a challenge, though, because historically the Soviet Union took over a state, if I can find that, here you go, Bessarabia or Bessarabia, however you're supposed to say that, either way, the Soviets will demand that at some point, they want to take this entire state from me, and historically, Romania had no choice but to give it to them. Actually, they also had to give up some land to Hungary and Bulgaria. We are going to try to change the tides of history there, and we are going to deny them Bessarabia, and instead, set up a whole load of forts, hopefully join the Axis, and by then I'm hoping the German Reich will be nice and strong, and then we'll beat the crap out of the Soviets. And then from there, I'll try joining the Allies, like they did historically, and try beating the crap out of the Germans. And that will be good enough for us, if we can survive. Always difficult to play as a small nation. If we're going to do this, though, we're probably going to have to start off with instituting a royal dictatorship, which will give us some extra political power. But Carol II will become the leader of the party, and as a result, his hedonistic lifestyle will create less national unity for the country. No matter what, though, because of his lavish lifestyle right here, we will occasionally get events that will either reduce our production substantially or cost us a ton of political power. Very unpleasant. Ultimately, one of the goals as playing as Romania is to find a way to deal with the king. Take advantage of him as long as you can to get cheap political leaders, right? And then either force him to abdicate or just kind of restrict his uh, powers constitutionally or... Let uh, King Michael take over, have a coup like they did historically. Or just focus down the non-aligned path and say all parties must end, you have to be a better king than this by God. A couple of different options for us there, we'll see what happens. Free civilian factories. Now we could build more civilian factories which would allow us to build things a little bit faster, and that is kind of tempting. That said, I think we're going to be hurting mostly for military production here. Uh, starting off with 13... Yeah, 13 civilian factories is not... Actually horrible to start off as a small nation like this. So yeah, I think we'll focus on getting a couple more military factories. We'll do a couple there. Build three more up um, and see how well that works out for us. As far as our production from military equipment, we are currently producing some infantry equipment, support equipment, artillery, and light tanks. Um, I don't know if I want the light tanks, to be honest. The light tanks do kind of suck. At least to start us off. It's a pretty low version, the 1934 version of light tanks. If I'm going to be producing anything, I'd much rather start with the 1936 version, or better yet, wait until 1939 and go for some medium tanks. Or even better yet, try licensing some Panzer tanks from the Germans. That could also be an option. So I don't know, I'm not sure going for the light tanks makes a lot of sense for us at this point. I think we just go ahead and cancel this production line, and instead focus on getting some more artillery. Uh, we'll also get a little bit more infantry equipment, and do we want more support or more artillery? Let's go for a bit more artillery. Now, if you don't know, in Hearts of Iron 4, there are several different production lines for different factories, and as you switch your production lines around, your efficiency will change. They have to retool all the machines in the factory and stuff, and it gradually re um, rebuilds, so you don't usually want to just change your factory production all willy-nilly. But since we haven't been really producing anything at the start of the game, this does sort of work. We're currently producing a submarine, which I guess is okay. Um, but what we probably want to do after that, after this one submarine is done, since it's already halfway done, is build some convoys afterwards and just start stockpiling stuff so we can start shipping resources around on the ocean. We probably will need steel from the Allies and stuff like that at some point. We also could start working on some more military stuff, like let's say building some motorized. I will go ahead and say that that will be a priority eventually, once we get a new military factory, but for now let's just focus on what I would say are some of the essentials. All right, that's not bad. Uh, as far as trade is concerned, we are lacking a little bit in the steel department. I could trade for some steel, 
but then we would have less civilian factories to build more military factories, so I think I'll hold off on that for now, but eventually we will want that. We are very low on manpower, unfortunately, and we do have some unassigned divisions. Um, I guess we go ahead and put them all into one army here. Let's assign a general. We have a field marshal, whose combat width is minus 10%. That can be useful, I guess. Um, there's another guy who's actually just straight up better, less supplies and combat width, so he's better in every way. Uh, the difference between field marshals and generals is field marshals do not have a limit to the number of troops they can control. Generals, however, do. They have a limit of 24. That said, generals usually will get better traits over time, so having uh, a couple of field marshals to hold the main line and a couple specialized generals to control the flanks is probably my favorite strategy in the game, but for now, we'll go with this. I will establish a front line along Bulgaria and along Hungary. Let us assign some troops there and half the troops there. There we go. And he should automatically move them around in preparation. All right, let's go up to speed five, I guess, since there's not a lot of reason to sort of sit around here. And we already get the first event with King Carol. Oh, joy. The king's mistress purchases a villa. Magda Lupescu, mistress of King Carol II, has reportedly purchased a new villa in an expensive suburb in Bucharest. How she could afford it was a subject of extensive speculation. New evidence in foreign newspapers strongly suggests that the king himself authorized the purchase with government money. The scandal is spreading. We must make a public announcement on the matter as soon as possible. We could either... Uh, the, king, the government has purchased the building and allowed her residence, which hurts our consumer goods which basically reduces the number of civilian factories we have access to for a while, or we could spend 90 political power, and instead of a 20% penalty, we have a 3% penalty, which is probably what we'll have to do to start off. We'll go into the negative, which really sucks, but let's go ahead and do that. So we'll have to make up a difference, a deficit with our uh, political power for a while, but yeah. We're going to get that event every once in a while and deal with the darn king. He is the greatest liability to the Kingdom of Romania, no doubt about it. Historically and uh, in the game, so that'll be fun. Hello, Soviet Union building troops along my borders. I'm not a fan of that. One thing we'll probably have to do, as I said before, is build a lot of forts. There is a river crossing, so in theory, he will have to take a massive penalty crossing over the river to get into my lands. And if I have a lot of forts to slow him down and stop him, he can take a lot of losses for relatively little cost on my end. Possibly, but, you know, we'll just sort of see what happens there. Okay, making some good progress on instituting the royal dictatorship. The extra 120 political power will be useful. That should make up for what was lost. We'll use that to hire somebody useful. Uh, we could go for the silent workhorse to get an extra 15% political power gain to make up for King Carol, which we may have to do. Alternatively, I may want to go for the military theorist, which gets me extra army experience per day which will allow me to customize my division templates kind of early on in the game. Very tempted to do something like that. It also reduces the cost of um, military doctrines when we're researching them, which is tempting. All right, the remilitarization of the Rhineland. The Germans are saying, screw this whole treaty thing. We are going to allow to have our uh, military on the borders of France right up in Mian, which will be worrying for us. But, I don't know, we're going to join the Axis pretty early on, so I'm not too worried that's going to happen. Institute Royal Dictatorship. Next, we could revise the Constitution. Now, this is what makes Carol actually somewhat good. So, um, we get a political advisor cost reduction across the board for every almost, almost every single field. Minus 25%, which will save us a lot of political power, almost making up for how much he costs us. It also gives us an extra recruitable population of 1%, which means more men that we can field on the, um, in the military. So we're going to have to do something like that, I think. And we may want to consider actually starting to recruit some troops. Um, what is our current troop situation looking like? We have mostly infantry, some cavalry, which is kind of meh. Also, it looks like a single tank division. Eh, not that great. We could try converting some of these cavalry into uh, infantry. Uh, let's see. What's the division templates look like? All right. So 18 combat width to start us off. We have support artillery and engineers. I probably will want to add more companies eventually, but there we go. Um, typically for, for infantry, what I'd like to see is uh, 7 infantry and 2 artillery, which is usually has a lot of soft attack, which means we do a lot of damage to infantry units. Heart attack is really good if you hit um, tanks and stuff like that. That's what I kind of would like to do, but we'll see. What I know we could do 
And see, here's the thing, right? You can use your army experience to try and change the templates up. Could do that. Alternatively, I know that Romania does actually have the Royal Guards Division, which gives you a unit of seven infantry and two artil uh, artillery, which is exactly what we want. So we basically could create the template for ourselves for free if we want to. So, yeah, I don't know. What do we have as far as cavalry? Ah, Only three cavalry, six combat width. They're terrible. Horrible. Mountaineers, 12 combat width. Eh, acceptable for specialists, I guess. And a couple motorized and some tanks. Yeah, this is pretty weak. Pretty darn weak. Um, we're not going to have much use for that for a little while, but oh well. well. We'll just sit with what we've got. It's probably okay, right? All right, getting a bit of political power in. I'm not going to spend any of it on political advisors until we have revised the Constitution and saved myself about 38 political power. Just because if we're going to have this loser of a, of a hedonist, then um, that's what we'll have to do. We no longer have the effects of dealing with the king, which means that event can fire again. It's kind of random when it does happen. Hopefully we have at least a little time. I'm going to go ahead and start working on mechanical computing, which again reduces research time by another 3%. Obviously that has an exponential effect throughout the course of the game and getting better technology. And since we only start with three um, research slots, that's going to be really important. Other countries like Germany, I think, start with four. So they'll get technology a lot faster than I will. Playing as a small nation like Romania is a bit tough. There's, a, there's definitely a huge challenge associated with it, but we'll do what we can. We will do what we can. Monthly growth in the States. Recruitable, 334. That's pretty pathetic. But all right. Whatever. One of the problems I have with playing as a small nation is your manpower pool usually is very small and does not last well for the rest of the game. Which is why we will probably want to join uh, the Axis or somebody and let them do the heavy lifting and we'll just take what we can and then backstab them. Which is my favorite way of playing the game. I love backstabbing. You guys have seen me do that. Alright, now we could move toward the Balkan Dominance, but what's the point? Because we do not have enough men in the battlefield... Uh, in order to demand Hungary or Bulgaria join us. So yeah, probably not important right now. Instead, I'd rather go for the Royal Foundation, which gets me an extra research slot, which is pretty cool. Another option would be Fortify the Borders, which uh, allows us to build forts a lot faster, 20%. That's pretty good. That said, uh, historically, what happened was exactly that kind of an effort, and the king embezzled all the money. So it was a massive ripoff. Romanians were not especially happy about that, if I understand correctly. Do you want to focus on concentrated industry or dispersed industry? Dispersed is usually more defensive. Concentrated usually is just more effective outright. I think I'm going to go for concentrated. I do really like focusing on an in uh, industry a lot at the beginning of the game. And kind of worry about that stuff later. Alright, let's go ahead and grab the military theorists. Now we are going to generate some army experience every day. Over time, that's going to let us manipulate our templates and try to strengthen up our individual divisions, make our troops a bit more effective. And now we have a bit more manpower to work with. So what I probably should go ahead and do is start recruiting, let's say, some infantry. Uh, let's see, another 10 or so would be nice. We'll just do it once for now. I will say, go ahead and build in Moldova, or sorry, Moldova, and then assign yourself to I don't know, one of the armies. Doesn't necessarily matter too much. The Spanish Civil War has begun between Nationalist Spain and Republican Spain, who is basically, it's the Communists versus the Fascists. Usually the Fascists win, but every once in a while that doesn't happen. It really will depend on whether the Germans uh, support them and send some troops to help. Which, when I've played Germany in the past, that's usually what I do and it works pretty well. You can get Spain to join the Axis. It's a good extra front to use against France. But even so. Oh, there we go. The King throws another lavish party. Okay. Despite being vetted by the king himself, the official coverage of the recent feast at the royal palace has caused great public dissent. Pictures of the king's mistress in an expensive French evening gown and detailed descriptions of the seven-course meal eaten from the golden plates have further inflamed, inflamed, inflamed the population, who are still suffering from the after-effects of the Great Depression. The king demands to make a public statement. Again, public consumer goods or political power. And as much as I hate losing the political power, uh, you know what? No, I'm going to go ahead and get, take the uh, consumer goods hit this time. I'm going to try to save up some political power so I can hire the silent workhorse and get a bit more political power generation. Which should offset a little bit of the damage of the king. Not great, but it's something, I suppose. We'll 
we'll work with it. All right, how are we looking as far as production? We are starting to generate some motorized now. That's good. Let's go ahead and stockpile that because I'm fairly confident I will need a lot. We do need to start trading for some steel because it's slowing down my production a lot. So let's trade with the Soviet Union. Um, two civilian factories, I guess, we'll have to do. There we go. And that way we can produce our infantry equipment and stuff at maximum efficiency. Since we do need a lot of it, we are 22,000 short right now, mostly because we are training a bunch of troops and they're going to need plenty of equipment. In fact, I probably should just go ahead and say supplies primarily go to reinforcements, not to upgrading the troops. I want to get more people on the battlefield pretty quickly, because the more troops I have fielded right now only... Uh, where is it? 250,000. If we can get up to 400,000, I can start demanding Hungary and Bulgaria serve me, which will make me a lot more po uh, powerful. So, that will be important. Alright, it is 1936. I don't want to pay the ahead of time penalty yet. Could work on radio. Not important right now. Uh, air, naval, land doctrine. Now, this is going to be a little bit tough for me. Which one do we really want to go for? Um, superior po firepower is tempting to me. It allows us to focus a lot on artillery and do a ton of damage to infantry. Tons. Basically, the idea behind superior firepower is it reduces our manpower and we just have to have pretty good production in order to make a lot of artillery and stuff like that. Uh, considering how little manpower we're going to have in the game, being a small nation, this seems tempting to me. I've heard it described uh, that basically the four different doctrines actually represent different uh, factions in World War II. Mobile Warfare mirroring the German Reich, superior firepower mirroring the United States, grand battle plan for the European powers, and mass assault for the Soviets. That's what I've heard. The other alternative is to go for mobile warfare, which is pretty good. I like mobile warfare a lot. I like outmaneuvering my opponents. The extra breakthrough is pretty nice. We could use some tanks. Actually, really want to focus a lot on tanks if we're going to do something like this. And on top of that, we could have either Blitzkrieg to get for lots of extra organization and just beat the crap out of our opponents, pierce through them. Or we'll have the option to get a lot of extra recruitable population since we may be low on manpower. So that's an option for us. I'm tempted to go for superior firepower, though. Superior firepower, extra soft attack, organization's good, defense is very good, especially against uh, the Soviets in the early game. Integrated supports or a recovery, soft attack. Ooh, that's a lot of soft attack, though. Shock and awe, airland battle. Yeah, there's a lot of good options here. I guess it does depend a little bit on the resources that we start with. Let's take a look at resources. So one of the advantages that Romania had historically in World War II is they were one of the uh, major oil producers of Europe. In fact, the uh, Germans did rely on them fairly heavily for oil, which is one of the reasons that the Allies bombed the crap out of Romania, which really caused a lot of public, uh, public dissent, and is one of the reasons King Michael was able to institute a coup. So if we have a lot of oil, that's pretty good as far as tank production. We don't have a lot of steel. That's what's hurting us. We'll have to trade for a ton of it. <sighs> I don't know. I think, I think if we're going to do a battle doctrine, we probably are going to go for superior firepower. I don't usually go for grand battle plan for entrenchment or mass assault because I find this is just way too wasteful with manpower. Only good if you have millions of manpower like the Soviet Union does. We're going to go for superior firepower and we are going to try to slowly but surely push through our opponents and conserve our manpower very heavily. Although, one more downside we should consider with superior firepower is when you finish a major war, one of the ways it calculates how much uh, victory points you get and how to determine the peace deals is based on how many men you lost, which I think is a little interesting. Um, so if we don't lose a lot of men, technically we'll probably get worse war deals, peace deals, but eh, we're going to go for it anyway. Superior firepower, this allows the suppressive barrage doc uh, battle tactic to be used, which will allow for extra attacker and defender uh, reduced defender damage, so... That's not bad. Plus, the extra 20% soft attack is not to be scoffed at. What that means, though, is we probably want to focus mostly on artillery. We'll have some supporting tank divisions eventually when I can get a bit more production going, but artillery is probably going to be what we want to use the most, which uh, I guess is okay. It uses mostly steel and tungsten in order to produce this stuff, which right now we are having a slight efficiency drop because we don't have enough tungsten. 
but I think we'll be okay. Notice, by the way, because we only recently got a factory spun up for motorized, its efficiency starts off pretty low and gradually increases as time goes on. It'll produce a lot faster. So you can see it's going up to 2.96, 2.99 per week, and so on. It's pretty good. Royal Foundation is done. Extra research slot for us. Um, I probably want to focus and get some, like, supporting weapons and stuff like that since we don't have it. Could alternatively start focusing down a bit of tanks, but if I'm not producing it right now, I'm going to say no to that. A few more months to go on this. Could go for excavation to get ourselves extra resources, more oil I can trade away. I don't need radio right now. Um, supporting companies, I do want recon eventually. Maybe not this second, though. Artillery, we could try upgrading. Make that a little bit better. More soft attack for our artillery. Um, now, eventually, we will have to decide whether we want to go for anti-tank or anti-air. And I say decide. You can go for both, but we're not going to ha have the production for both, probably. Between the two, I think I'm actually going to go for anti-air, believe it or not. Because anti-air only costs a little bit of steel. And it does add a bit of piercing value onto your uh, divisions. And they can take down uh, planes. Whereas anti-tank, which is where you want to have a lot of piercing, like a ton more piercing, also costs some extra tungsten. So this is kind of the poor man's anti-tank, I think. Not nearly as good at piercing tanks, but still it's something. It adds a bit more to my divisions. I might go for that. Do you want interwar artillery? I think first we're going to go ahead and grab the support weapons, since we know we're going to need that no matter what. Just a stat increase for all my infantry across the board. New national focus required. So I think now is the point where we probably, whoops, clicked off the game, probably want to start going toward the Balkan dominance and get ready to move against Bulgaria and Hungary. And I'm going to do exactly that. Right now we still have only 250,000 people in the field, but we are working on training up some more if I can just get a bit more equipment. We're missing a lot of infantry equipment and artillery and support equipment and so on. Yeah, that does kind of suck. Let's see. Yeah, we're missing so much equipment right now. It's going to take us a little while to get that going, I think. The games of the 11th Olympiad. Olympic games and stuff. Don't think I care too much about that. Do I want to trade for a bit of extra tungsten? Just so I can produce my artillery a little bit faster? The problem is it uses up one of my civilian factories for trade, which is what I'm using to build new factories. But, I don't know. I mean, training up my production, my artillery a little bit faster could be good. How much are we losing, really? Lack of resources minus 10% efficiency. Honestly, I think it's more important that we just keep building factories for now. So we'll just go ahead and wait for that. Missing equipment production. Light tanks. Yeah, I'm not really making use of that. But I only have one division, so it's not much to reinforce. Alright, modify the government. We can go for the silent workhorse, which increases our political power gain. Now we're getting 1.3 per day instead of just one. Uh, which, by the way, is calculated based on the base value. The base value is 2, the extra 15% means we actually get an extra 0.3. We're spending 1 for Balkan dominance, uh, for our national focus, so... For those of you who looked at the math and were like, wait a minute, 15% of 1 isn't 0.3? You're correct. That's why it's going off the base value instead, which is to my advantage. I much prefer it that way. Alright, so I think we're kind of running out of time for this video. I'm going to try to do, uh, roughly half-hour segments as usual. I know this is kind of a slow start to the game. I'm assuming that some people haven't seen Hearts of Iron 4 before, which is one of the reasons I'm doing it this way. Uh, in the future, one thing we want to work toward is getting partial mobilization so we can reduce our common, uh, consumer goods, make better use of civilian factories. But we're going to have to have 15% world tension for that to work. I don't want to get early mobilization because why spend 112 now when I can just jump up to partial mobilization as soon as the Japanese do something bad? So yeah, there's that. Probably want to move toward uh, better conscription laws and stuff. I may even want to consider working toward free trade. Which will send more resources to market and spend off some of our beautiful, beautiful oil to get extra civilian factories that I can use. Probably will work out well for me, but we will see. Thank you all very much for watching. Uh, I know it's a bit of a slow start, but I hope you are looking forward to the series anyway. If so, then be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. And I, as always, will see you guys next time. <laughs>